Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. For today's video, I'm going to be discussing a topic that was requested by you guys in the comments section. I always read the comments, so if you want a topic made, then be sure to request it. The next one might be yours. In this video, I'm going to be discussing Severus Snape, Lily Evans, James Potter, and one of the purest forms of magic, the Patronus. The Patronus charm is famous for its representation of light, happiness, and purity, and it's produced when a witch or wizard casts the spell Expecto Patronum. There are two types of Patronus charms, corporeal and incorporeal, and the type that the witch or wizard casts will depend on their experience or preference. The more basic form of the spell is the incorporeal Patronus, which assumes no animal form and simply resembles a burst of white vapor or smoke, and the more advanced form of the spell is the conjuring of a corporeal Patronus, which I'll be focusing on in this video. We see many of our favorite characters in the books and films achieve the notable and complicated ability to cast a corporeal Patronus, and this can largely be attributed to the guidance provided by Harry in Dumbledore's army. Along with those in Dumbledore's army, various other talented witches, wizards, and professors are also able to cast such a charm, Harry's parents included. Despite Snape's dubious past as a Death Eater, it has been stated that he was the only Death Eater that was ever able to produce one. It's widely thought that conjuring a Patronus when you're evil is impossible, but that's not entirely accurate, it's just risky. In the story of Rexidian, the first evil wizard ever to attempt the spell, he ended up being devoured by maggots, which shot out of his wand. This doesn't exactly make it inviting, but what Rexidian lacked were the necessary happy memories that you need in order to cast such a spell. Despite Snape's questionable history and the hardships that he endured throughout his life, he was still always able to think back to happier times, his childhood in Cokeworth with Lily Evans. We know that James Potter's Patronus was a stag, and we know that Lily's was a doe, and it's revealed to us in an iconic exchange between Dumbledore and Snape in the Deathly Hallows that Snape's Patronus is a doe as well. But this is touching, Severus, said Dumbledore seriously. Have you grown to care for the boy, after all? For him? shouted Snape. Expecto Patronum. From the tip of his wand burst the silver doe. She landed on the office floor, bounded once across the office, and soared out of the window. Dumbledore watched her fly away, and as her silvery glow faded, he turned back to Snape, and his eyes were full of tears. After all this time? Always, said Snape. This scene depicts Dumbledore's genuine surprise at Snape's Patronus form, a doe, as he never understood the true level of commitment that Snape felt toward Lily. Dumbledore never suspected that Snape's motivations had changed, but when he says, after all this time, to Snape, it paints a clear picture of just how much Snape cared for Lily. Dumbledore knew that Lily Potter's Patronus was also a doe, and it's well known that when you well and truly love someone, that your Patronus can change to match theirs. The Patronus charm is a powerful piece of magic that expresses the true nature of the caster and can be influenced by significant events or people in one's life. You can't choose your Patronus or change it willfully, and the fact that Snape's Patronus was still a doe matching Lily after all that time was representative of the fact that he truly loved Lily, and that his feelings for her hadn't weakened over the years. Lily Potter had been dead for 17 years, but his love for her was still strong. However, one thing that I'm sure a lot of you have been wondering is, what was Snape's Patronus before it changed to a doe? If the Patronus changes to match the one that you love, then I think that it would be reasonable to assume that Snape had another Patronus animal at one point or another, one that was independent from Lily. However, here's the thing. Snape always loved Lily, from the moment they met in childhood. They spent so much time together in their formative years in the town of Cokeworth, and created such a bond that I think their Patronus forms were perhaps influenced by one another. It's untelling when your corporeal Patronus form is actually determined or assigned to a witch or wizard, but given that it is influenced by significant events or people, it's reasonable to assume that it's not a predefined thing. For this reason, I think that from the moment that Snape and Lily met, they were destined to have the same Patronus, though there is a possibility that Snape had his own Patronus form, independent from Lily, before his changed, I personally believe that his Patronus was always a doe. One theory that I have surrounding this is that it was actually Lily's Patronus that changed, rather than Snape's, out of her love for Snape, rather than the other way around. Though they went in very different directions later in life, they were very close for very many years, and there was certainly a point in time in which James Potter was not even remotely on Lily's radar. This opens up a whole other can of worms, but it's an interesting thought. So, if Snape's Patronus wasn't always a doe, 
If Snape had his own Patronus form at one point or another, what would it have been? I have a few theories for this. It's well known that the possibilities for what a Patronus can actually be are fairly endless, though magical creatures such as dragons, thestrals, and phoenixes are exceedingly rare. No reliable system for predicting the form of an individual's Patronus has ever been found, although the great 18th century researcher of charms, Professor Catalyst Spangle, set forth certain principles that are widely accepted as true. The Patronus, asserted Spangle, represents that which is hidden, unknown but necessary within the personality. Here, says Spangle, is the explanation for the appearance of Patronuses in forms that their casters might not expect, for which they have never felt a particular affinity, or, in rare cases, even recognize. This doesn't exactly help us to narrow down what Snape's Patronus could have originally been, but if we dig deep into Snape's character and personality traits, I think that we can derive some options. One of the things about Snape that stands out to me most is his lifelong devotion to Lily, a kind of loyalty that would have been ingrained in his very persona. Based on this trait, there are a few animals that come to mind. Number 1. Turtle Dove Turtle doves are common throughout Europe and have become a symbol of eternal love, notably featured in William Shakespeare's poems and as a pair in The Twelve Days of Christmas. Their mating for life has been the reason they've become associated with love, although their mournful voice also has influenced their place in culture. The turtle dove is also one of the animals that will remain alone if their mate dies. Number 2. Prairie Vole When a male prairie vole chooses a female, that is the female that it will remain with for the rest of its life. If the female dies, the male will not look for a new mate. Prairie voles are rarely seen because they live in underground burrows and are usually nocturnal. Rarely seen, lifelong commitment, underground burrow, sounds like Snape to me. Number 3. Black Vulture Black vultures are quite physically intimidating, and at first glance may not immediately appear to be good representations of love and romance. However, the black vulture is actually quite an amorous creature, and once they mate, they mate for life, never searching for another partner. I feel that the physical stature of the black vulture particularly resonates with Snape. Number 4. Swans Swans are probably the animal most commonly associated with love, a reputation garnered by the heart shape the couples form with their necks. Like the other animals above, they mate for life, and remain alone after their mate dies. Though commonly white, some swans can actually have black plumage, which I think would be more than fitting for Snape. I don't think that any of the options above are necessarily more fitting than the others, but I am inclined to believe that some kind of bird Patronus would be most fitting, as he is one of the only known witches and wizards with the ability to fly. What do you guys think? Was Snape's Patronus always a doe? If it wasn't, what could it have been? What are your thoughts on the animals that I theorized? Let me know down in the comment section below. Until next time, you're a wizard Harry.